So, hello everyone. Um, uh, I know it's uh, lunch next, so I'm going to keep you, keep you waiting for the lunch a bit while. But I'm going to talk about AWS Cloud Development Kit, which is a framework for defining your cloud infrastructure in AWS and how it might help you with multi-account and multi-environment setups. First of all, a bit of background. I work at Alma Media, which is, as you can probably guess from the name, it's a media company and we have a lot of new sites and B2C and B2B services as well. We're based in Finland. Uh, we have also a business here in Sweden as well and in Eastern Central Europe. We have in total 280 developers and 150 or so are in Finland. We reach about 80% of Finnish population and we get quite a lot of traffic to our sites and apps. Uh, we love infrastructure as a code uh, because, well, we have somewhere around 100 AWS accounts. Uh, we also like servers quite a lot, and we, on that note, we have something in the ballpark of 2 billion Lambda invocations per month. And if there are any Finns in the audience, you'll probably recognize some of the brands there. And here's Alma on the map, and here's some key figures. I guess for this crowd, the most interesting one is the 100 plus websites and apps, so there's quite a lot of stuff going on. A bit about the team I work with. Uh, we do web services and APIs. Nowadays, actually, GraphQL APIs quite a lot, so shout out to AppSync. And integrations between different systems, all sorts of utilities, libraries, tools, scripts, what have you, also then React.js and other UI components. So pretty full stack, but the key point here is that uh, my team does this for like, let's say all Alma's uh, services, or, or they are like uh, components that are used by many of Alma's, Alma's different websites and services. So if you visit any of our websites, your browser is probably going to execute some JavaScript or call an API that's done by my team. A bit about me. So yeah, I'm a solution architect now, nine years at Alma. I have a couple cloud certificates. You can probably guess which is my favorite cloud from the ratio of the certificates there. Um, you see the case since... Uh, pretty early on, running it in production almost a year, and Go and TypeScript are my favorite languages, but then to the actual topic, how to cloud. So uh, let's do a quick show of hands. Uh, well, first of all, I think everyone here knows about AWS since you're here, but quick show of hands, how many of you use infrastructure orchestration tools like CloudFormation or Terraform? Okay, good. Uh, then uh, show of hands, how many of you use CDK? Okay. so. I'm talking to an exactly right audience. There are a few people who are using, but I'm going to have something. You won't need to leave then to the other place because you will hopefully learn something from this. But a quick recap is that, uh, for example, at Almo, we started at AWS around 2012 or something like that. But anyways, when you start with uh, cloud tools, you first play around with the UI and, and sort of manual approach and learn things. Uh, but there's, you know, it, it's good because it's a sensible default and so on, but it's hard to, like, if you need to reproduce, like, multiple environments, it's, like, tedious job and it's error-prone and time-consuming because it's manual labor. Well, we are developers, we are thinking that, okay, manual labor, we're going to script this, and that's uh, usually the first thing. And if you're using tools like CLI or SDKs, it's like uh, creating the new resources is pretty easy, uh, but what about, let's say, managing AWS API errors or if you're updating existing resources, how you manage their state, uh, on the, if, if, if you're changing the existing resources, and what about rollbacks if there are errors and things like that. So these things get hard in this model. So the next obvious thing is, of course, use like uh, do like infrastructure via this like more config tools, like exactly like CloudFormation and Terraform and similar. Uh, the really good thing is that they're declarative, so you describe the desired state and let the tool actually take care of all the or what it actually needs to be done to achieve that state. And it's easy to automate and it's easy to reproduce like new environments. So basically you can have a, like a one cloud formation template and get the multiple environments out of it by using parameters and so on. But the bad things, uh, configura it's configuration syntax. I know this is not necessarily a fact. This might be a more like a matter of preference, but I personally, I don't like looking at long, long, long configuration files. And uh, also there's usually no abstraction there. Uh, instead, you need to work with uh, like the really nitty gritty details there. And at least for me, because I cannot really remember CloudFormation specification out of my head, so when I'm working with CloudFormation, I have my editor, CloudFormation, documentation, I'm jumping back for editor, documentation, editor, documentation. So, <clears throat> and here's a screenshot of some old, 
old cloud formation template of mine, like simple network it's called, and it's still 200 lines, so <laughs> we need something. Uh, then there's tools like the Troposphere Go formation, um, which basically gen generate uh, cloud formation. And um, I actually haven't used those, so I, I'm not an authority to speak about them. But they have the same benefits as the, like, uh, with the configuration model, but they're all also real code, so you get some benefits out of your editor. It, it provides like intelligence and auto-completions and things like that. But again, there's no abstraction. So now we jump into the CDK, where it might help. So CDK, it's a framework for defining cloud infrastructure using familiar programming languages. Familiar programming languages, that being one of the key points, and then also the built-in abstractions. Besides the built-in ab abstractions, uh, you can develop your own and also use open-sourced ones. So those are the key points. Uh, CDK itself, uh, you can write it in uh, different languages, TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, Java, and C Sharp. Uh, how that happens is it's powered by this module called JSII. And uh, that allows you to interact with JavaScript classes from another programming languages. Uh, if you want to learn more, it's, uh, the GitHub page has, has more about it, so GitHub JSII. Uh, then to the actual CDK itself. Uh, the main concepts in CDK are the constructs. Uh, it has different kind of constructs. And when you're defining your cloud uh, infrastructure, you're basically modeling your infrastructure as this uh, construct tree in CDK. So the top level construct there is uh, app. So it's, it's, it's the top level and it contains everything. And then below the app, there are stacks. There can be one stack, there can be multiple stacks. Uh, those basically map to cloud formation stacks. And um, the stacks can be also in uh, different regions too. And uh, below the stacks, there are then the like, more lower level constructs. There can be two kind of constructs. Uh, there can be like, Resource constructs, constructs, like it could be just like one lambda function, that's a construct too. But there can be more like these abstract constructs. You could have some kind of a S3 notification construct which uh, encapsulates like an S3 bucket and lambda and maybe something else. So that's what basically CDK application looks. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so about the abstraction. Uh, there's three levels, actually. Uh, the first, the lowest level, is uh, that CDK provides these, uh, uh, like, level one, they are calling it, uh, cloud formation resources. These are resources that one, uh, like, map one to one to actual cloud formation resources. So when the cloud formation resource specification changes, that's some kind of a massive JSON or JSON files. Uh, so they automatically generate uh, level one constructs out of them. Uh, then there's uh, level two constructs. Those are the built-in ones in the CDK library. Uh, they are like uh, really well thought out uh, 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 components, let's say, uh, that are well built by AWS and also there's a lot of open source contributors there. So CDK is open source, forgot to mention that. And, um, and also besides those level two constructs, there's this like level three. I'm not sure if that's an official term they're using, but seen it in a couple places and it makes sense. So level three is basically something that you uh, make yourself. So you combine these level one and two constructs in some way and mix and match and like bring up some abstract idea and encapsulate it and that's your level three construct. Uh, the nice thing about CDK is that in some tools, uh, if you're using some kind of abstraction, if the abstraction fails for you, you might need to ditch the whole tool. But in CDK, there's that if the abstraction level fails for you, that you need to do something more specific that the abstraction doesn't support, you can always go down a level. So down to the level one where there's this cloud formation resource. So you can do pretty, pretty much everything you could in cloud formation templates as well. <coughs> So how, how the deployment actually happens, or how, how do the actual resources in AWS actually are created? You have your CDK source code, then you, with all the constructs, then you run the CDK command line interface tool, and that will uh, synthesize the CDK source into this sort of deployment package kind of thing. It consists of like, cloud, like basic cloud formation templates, and then also the assets. Think of like Lambda function code and things like that. And then just cloud formation is used for deployment, so you get all the benefits like rollbacks and things like that from cloud formation. So uh, let's do a quick demo. Uh, 
I'm a bit scared here, so let's wish this goes somehow well, but I've actually cheated quite a lot here. I've already installed basically every dependency I'll need here, and also I run the CDK bootstrap and things like that, because those are really good. They have really well documentation about those in the CDK website, so I'm not going to show about them. Uh, basically, I have here uh, uh, one uh, CDK stack. I also have in the bin folder, this is the CDK default setup. In the bin folder, I have the app already where I just import the stack and pass in some props. Basically, those props tell me that I'm deploying to Ireland and things like that. And I've actually already uh, sort of have this, uh, when you actually bootstrap uh, the, or run the uh, CDK in it, you basically get this like uh, bare bones skeleton uh, application with one stack, so you can start that to build things. And I already have things like imported here, so we can get going. So now we're gonna do a, a VPC networking here. I'm using the EC2 module, and uh, we have the VCP, VPC class here. This is the level two contract. Um, actually, do you see? I'm gonna put a bit more bigger that. So <clears throat> this is the a level two construct, but if you if this wouldn't work for you, you could always use there's a CFN VPC. So these level one uh, constructs they always prefixed with the CFN name. So you could use the lower level one, and you can sort of mix and match that that you could create another resource in level one and then like reference it in a, a level two resource. So it works like that. But uh, we're gonna use use the default one. The first parameter is the scope, then we give it some name. I had the, there the name, and uh, only uh, required parameter is the cider, so we need to give it, give it some cider there. And let's pass it like this. So, ta-da, we have a, a VPC basically. Uh, the CDK, as I said, it provides some sensible defaults there. I'm gonna put, uh, I have, as I have a TypeScript set up, so I'm going to put the compiler in the background, and then I'm going to run this, uh, sorry, uh, run this synth tool, which basically output cloud formation. And uh, actually, I'm going to put it into, uh, into the folder there, so we can see that what there actually is. Like so. So it generated this cloud formation, uh, yeah, cloud formation file. So 400 lines. Of course, this contains quite a lot of metadata, but still, you know, VPC networking with all the subnets and NAT gateways and routing tables and everything, it's 200 lines at least, so it's nice to get it from like few lines of code. Uh, then if you're using Visual Studio Code, there's this uh, CDK Explorer toolkit, so you can use it actually I need to refresh this one. So once you synthesize, you can actually uh, use this. It, it provides this like a really nice D, uh, sorry, tree structure, and it shows what your uh, CDK application is going to actually output. So uh, in my case, I was using the default setup there. Uh, so it creates like a, it actually does a lookup. Uh, to which region you're de deploying into. I'm deploying into Ireland, so it looks up, okay, there's three AZs, availability zones out there. So it decides that, okay, hey, I'm gonna make a highly available setup. So three public subnets, uh, three private subnets, and in each public subnet, subnets, there's also a NAT gateway there. Uh, but, for example, if we want to save some cost, let's say this is some kind of a development environment, we could just say uh, NAT gateways and one, and that would then, if we synthesize this, that would mean that there will be only only uh, one. So if we now look at the public subnet two, there's a NAT gateway. Let's oh, I forgot to refresh. I was all refresh this. I was scared that did I did I already fail a demo here? Let's see. So now there's no NAT gateway in public subnet two. So so that way you can configure it. Then you can also configure your subnets via this subnet configuration. You oh, sister, and this is the good thing about it that the, uh, this, this is code. Your editor is like supporting you really well. So I'm making all sorts of mistakes here. Let's say subnet type easy to subnet. Uh, it was subnet type. Let's say this is private and. We give some name to it, let's just say private, and we need to give some cider mask to it, let's say 27, something like that. Uh, and then we do uh, magic of copy-paste here. Uh, let's say this is public. Let's say this is isolate, uh, isolated. 
like this. Isolated means it doesn't have a root to internet, and like so. Uh, now we can specify act actually what uh, I have a, a box somewhere. Uh, what is happening there? I expect that I'm missing some. Uh, ah, there's one missing. Let's put it there. Is it happy? Uh, oh, demo effect is too. Well, I hate these demos. Well, that's that's why I'm a big cheat. So <laughs> this is this is how you do live demos. You basically uh, make them ready, and then when you're like, like okay, want to do something, like okay, done, <laughs> professional thing, yes. Uh, but as I was showing, pretty successfully. Uh, so you can specify how you want your network. But if you don't want it, uh, like if if you want, for example, in your private subnets, you have to want to have the most IPs. You can just leave this out, and then you can. Uh, synthesize it, and it will actually calculate that how many, what kind of IP segments there are. So, for let's refresh this again. Uh, if we take a look at uh, private subnet, subnet, cider block, let's make this larger. So you can see it's now slash 18. So it calculated it by itself. But yeah, that's a bit about the uh, bit about the uh, how this uh, CDK. How, how CDK works with all these abstractions and level two constructs. And also, <coughs> you could, <coughs> I don't have a demo about this, uh, but you can, you can also test your actual CDK code. So uh, you can write with this tool called CDK assert. You can basically do unit testing against your CDK code, verify parts of the templates, check existence of resources, and you can also do snapshot testing. There's a screenshot about the snapshot testing. So. Uh, it uses tool called Chess that it basically shows this diff that what has changed and you have to manually approve it and things like that, pretty useful stuff. Um, let's uh, check out another demo. Uh, let's see how successful this one is. So again, I need to change a bit of folders here quickly. Uh, demo 2, cd dash dash demo 2, npm run watch, and Let's see if how this one goes, or do I end up copy pasting again? Uh, so f now we are going to make an S3 bucket which uh, takes a file, and then Lambda will uh, be triggered from it, and it will put it to DynamoDB. So we're going to make a new bucket here. Again, we're going to use this like uh, level two uh, level two uh, construct. Uh, and that's actually about it, about the bucket. We don't need to, if we would like to, we could specify the bucket name here, some string, but because uh, S3 bucket names are uh, have to be globally unique, and I don't want any of you like quickly creating a bucket with the same name and ruining my demo, so that's why I'm using this, this method, so it basically generates a, a name for the, name for the uh, uh, bucket uh, by itself. Uh, basically using that uh, that string and then some random characters there. And then I'm going to create the DynamoDB table. Uh, let's see how this one goes. This is the, usually the one wh which, uh, where I forget forget things that how I was supposed to. Oh, now I open it up. Oh, Siri, go away. Huh. That's not good. Uh, so DynamoDB needs, it needs a partition key and it needs a name. Uh, let's call it etag in my case and type and that was DynamoDB attribute type. So again, the editor helps me. I have no idea what I'm doing, but the editor helps me here. So remember the doc, Meme. I have no idea what I'm doing. That's how I feel like this at the moment. Then we're going to do a quick lambda function. Uh, lambda function. This, uh, then I'm going to use function. Uh, we need to sum. Uh, idea that runtime, yeah, we can uh, use Node.js, so lambda uh, runtime, I don't know, Node.js 12.x, uh, then we need to specify handler. Well, again, I've cheated somewhat, so I have the actual lambda func function made already, and um, because that, that's some, just basically some boilerplate code, so it's not really interesting in this 
a case, we need to provide some source code for it. So we're going to use this uh, method called lambda.code.from asset, and I'm going to provide a path. Hopefully, this is the right one. Let's see. So now we have the lambda functions, S3 buckets. Uh, then we're going to need to map map some map the notification from the bucket to lambda. Let's save this into variables, uh, like so, uh, and fn here. So <coughs> we need to add add, uh, uh, add event notification. <sighs> Let's see, uh, S3 uh, event, some event type, yeah, object created, I think sounds good. Then we need to use this S3 notification component. Actually, we need to instantiate it. Uh, lambda destination. And we pass in the lambda function there. So now it's tied together. Then we need to tell the lambda a couple things. It's actually waiting for this specific. I'm a bit in a hurry, so I'm not going to show the lambda code itself. But trust me, it's a bucket table. This is totally wrong. Don't trust me in that bucket name. Uh, so it's going to wait wait to get the bucket name so it knows where to get the actual actual file. And we pass in the bucket name. Also, we add uh, the table name, uh, and it's uh, the table, that table name. So we're passing values from the from the uh, other constructs like so. And then the cool part, because uh, for this to work, you need uh, like uh, define IAM policies for the execution role for the Lambda uh, environment, so that it would have access to the bucket. And then also it needs to write to the DynamoDB table. So I don't know about you, but I hate writing those IAM policies. So uh, I, I can't never remember those. I always copy paste and them. And then it's annoying, especially with S3 buckets, you have to remember when do I put the uh, slash wildcards and what have you. So uh, in this model, it's pretty nice. You say, first of all, we give the uh, read access to the function. We say bucket uh, grant. Well, we're not going to need like read write. We only need read access. So we're going to say grant read. We pass in the lambda function. That's done there. Then uh, we need to add access to the Dynamo TP table. So we can add, it needs a, I think it needs a write access because it's writing data there. So there, that should be it. Let's see what's there. If we synthesize, at least there's no compilation errors. Oh, there is. Uh, no, no, isn't what? What? Twenty-eight. Ah, oh, what's happening there? Lamp. Ah, lamp the demo. Ah, uh, demo lamp. Ah, two. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, demo lambda. Yeah, like so. Let's see. If I can manage this without copy paste, yay! And now we can also refresh this one. Uh, we can see what's happening there. Uh, it's created bucket table and function and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, uh, let's see how this does this work. Uh, actually, we need to deploy it first before it can work. So we can uh, we can uh, can 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 uh, first check a diff. There, let's see. It should show, the, okay, there are no differences. Let's see, uh, maybe I deployed this already. Let's see. Uh, can't remember actually, did I? Oh, it's already there. Oh, well, you're gonna trust me, trust me it works. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's open the S3 bucket uh, and, and see if that might work. Uh, so S3 and uh, Actually, I didn't test this, so <laughs> a bit scary. This actually might not work. Let's see. This should be the bucket. And uh, let's open the file. Oh, my God. Where is it? Uh, I have here. Uh, let's open this, for example, reveal in Finder. I didn't account for this, uh, this, this, this multi. I can actually upload it from here. So add files. And then I'm going to find it from here, hopefully, yes. Uh, next, 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 upload. Yes, and uh, 
moment or two that I might have might have uh, got this working. Let's see. Tables. Oh my god, there are many tables. I forgot which one was it. Uh, it was, I think it was this. Let's see. And yeah, there it is. Hello, AWS Norix. Yay. So it works. So basically, uh, quite a uh, like easy thing to string these resources together with the CDK. Uh, then we're gonna let's close the finder. Uh, we're gonna do a quick refactor. So, uh, if this is something that you realize that you're going to need in many places in your organization, you have multiple projects that you need this tool that takes this uh, file from S3 and puts it into DynamoDB, you're probably going to want to like somehow make it more like a component like that you can share it with your colleagues or open source it or some things like that. So, <clears throat> let's create something like this uh, uh, that we can just say we create a bucket and a table because those might exist, but we uh, provide this uh, like functionality that puts the stuff from S3 to Dynamo. We provide it as this kind of a top level uh, level three construct. So we have a file here, and again, I'm really lazy. That's also also because I'm on a tight tight schedule. So we have al already an interface made. So we need to pass the bucket, and we need to pass the table. So we're gonna export class S3 to Dynamo, and it extends this uh, CDK construct, like so. And the constructor is the scope, it's CDK dot construct uh, ID string, and uh, props uh, is the type of SD Dynamo props there. And um, like so, and then we go super scope and ID. And again, as you can see, I'm a professional uh, programmer, so I copy-paste the code a lot. So, not from Stack Overflow this time, but yeah, let's change directories. CD, demo tree, and npm run watch. Let's see, did I make a mess here? Oh, yes. And then let's do CDK synth. Yes. And now let's use the, again, the explorer uh, here and check out what it's made. So again, there's this, my bucket, my table, but now there's this, it doesn't show the lambda function directly underneath. Instead, it shows this construct called ST, ST to Trinamo. And there you can see there's the, like these uh, lambda resources and service roles and things like that. Uh, actually, my <laughs> it's, it's show, show, showing my AWS Nordic bucket because I actually renamed, uh, I have the, my uh, function name there, type or wrong, sorry about that, but trust me, it's a Lambda function. It has code and, and the service role and things like that. And uh, uh, that's, again, if you, can, if you see here, that's pretty easy. Now you can like uh, just say new S3 to Dynamo in your project and use it like this. We could take this a bit further as well. So if there's like, um, if you have a, because CloudFormation has a limit of 200 resources per uh, stack. So it's like giving a child, a candy to a child, so they want more. So if they're gonna use a lot of these, they might end up the resource limit. So we can also do it like this. So we say CloudFormation and nested stack. So this will, uh, Make, make it as a separate stack, so you won't hit this like uh, uh, 200 resource limit. And if we refresh this, and we can see there's now a nested stack created here. So pretty handy. Um, then you're probably thinking like, hey, hold on, wasn't you supposed to talk something about multi-accounts and multi-environments? And yeah, I have a couple minutes left, uh, 10 minutes left to talk about it, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, this is one kind of a way to set up accounts. I'm not saying this is the right way. This is my way, so this is right for me. <laughs> but, but everyone has their preference. And to have this kind of a setup, you of course need some kind of a, like you need AWS organizations, and you need um, you need either the control tower or your own automation to because manually building these is quite painful. Uh, but yeah, we have this kind of a setup in my team that uh, we have like per pro project or product, depending. It's a bit like 
there isn't strict boundaries, what is a product and project there, but and, and, and what kind of a stuff we put to an AWS account. But generally speaking, let's say product X, it will have two accounts, product account and dev account. The dev account will have these development environments where every everyone can manually deploy and try things out if they want. Then there's feature environments that get triggered from a CI if the branch, Git branch, starts with feature slash and uh, integration which is up to date with master and then production and possibly pre-production that are triggered manually but the CI deploys them if, if triggered. Uh, so we can have this kind of a setup but uh, especially if you've been uh, doing AWS quite a lot your setup might look something like this. Uh, for example, my team has these kind of accounts, and there are many teams in Alma. As I said, 150 developers in Finland, so we have all mix and match setups. So there are different different kind of setups. Um, so how do you provide some kind of a, like uh, shared functionality to these kind of uh, uh, these kind of uh, account setups? So if you're using CDK, you, one way is use those level three level three constructs. So think version at reusable library like code that you publish to your organization. So npm install your cloud. In some sense, we use npm JS. Uh, you might use GitHub packages or Artifactory or what have you, any repository you have for the language you're doing your CDK. Uh, so basically, you can uh, publish like comp constructs there uh, that solve a specific purpose, and then multiple teams can use it in uh, multiple accounts and multiple projects. So it's pretty handy handy way. And the nice thing is that uh, previously with CloudFormation, it ended up that you had, might have had some shared repository with CloudFormation files. And I don't know, somebody accidentally changed something and there's like really not good like versioning and things like that. So it's easy, easy to break things. But the nice thing, OK, you can break things with these two. I'm not, say, I'm not denying that. But the nice thing is that uses uh, the dependency management of the language that you're uh, developing in. So that's, that's pretty handy. A uh, couple examples. Uh, we are like, we are, haven't done this like uh, this. Uh, like shared components with uh, CDK for long, but a couple of things we have is like I'm I'm big fan of tagging. I, I I get some weird satisfaction when I see that that templates and resources have nice tags. I don't know if it's probably just for me this thing because nobody else cares. But anyway, we have this tool that if you provide in the package JSON, you provide some basic information like author and base domain and product and what have you. Then it also reads from something from Git uh, Git uh, state and also from environment environment variables and it validates those uh, uh, values and checks that they are actually there. So it will use those and generate these nice tags to every resource there. So I, I feel warm and fuzzy when I see them. Uh, one thing is that we have this tool that uh, creates like these environments. Uh, well, uh, defines environments in some sense. So if the project has this like nice little badge there that accounts and environments, I will know that uh, the project will then use this like uh, this certain way of uh, configuring AWS accounts. So it most probably will have the dev and prod accounts. And in those accounts, there is a, a whitelisted set of environments. So in production account, you will only have pre-production and production and things like that. So <clears throat> that's, that's also the nice thing that uh, as it's called, you can do all sorts of validation. For example, this tool, uh, requires that you have like accounts that JSON file in your repository. So we do uh, JSON schema validation for it and things like that. So again, it's code. You can do all sorts of things. Uh, for those environments, we have a tool that manages Road 53 for all the environments with different accounts and things like that. Then this is uh, interesting because we have the feature environments. I've been working. This is still a proof of concept. So I'm not making any promises. This actually actually works. The basic thing works here that you import this you would only import this to your dev account and, and uh, where we have the feature branches. So import this tool, it basically deploys a Lambda that's scheduled and it goes through the CloudFormation stacks. It checks if they have a tag feature and certain naming uh, convention in the stack name and it will then check when it's last updated. Let's say it hasn't been updated in a week, so it calls it that, says that, okay, you need to be deleted. So it starts to deleting, but there's still things to 
solve recording uh, retaining assets like uh, S3 buckets with stuff in them and things like that. But if I get this working, I will probably open source it. But let's see. But that's nice if you have like automated feature branches. So it's nice to have also automated cleaning for them. And um, yeah, remember it's just code, so you can do all sorts of nice things in CDK, like checking like okay something specific for, for, for because I I hate like conditions in cloud formations. I hope I'm not alone, but I I don't like them. It's annoying to work with them. So uh, as it's code, you can do all sorts of things. We use this stable environment thing. Um, I'm not sure if that's the prettiest way of doing it, but uh, we sort of define that production, pre-production and integration are sort of stable. In some sense, they are not development or feature branches. So for those environments, we, for example, uh, we retain resources. So if they would get actually deleted, at least some, some resources will stay there. Of course, there's termination protection, but anyway, uh, then you can do like... Uh, for example, backup retention periods, you can uh, adjust those to actually save a bit of money there. Uh, also, like you can adjust caching and any, anything that, that you can potentially save. For example, that uh, in, in dev, dev environment, uh, sorry, dev account, you could like say only one NAT gateway or things like that. You could like small savings here and there with, with this kind of a functionality. Then I've been talking about the, uh, the TypeScript experience here and showing the demos there. But as I said, you can write, uh, write uh, the CDK in TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, Java, and C Sharp. And if you're doing this kind of a, uh, like reusable library-like components uh, that you share with uh, maybe other people in your other teams in your organization or even open source, uh, then it might be a good idea to actually support all the languages. At the moment, we are in the, uh, in the, in the spot or in a position where our uh, components that we do are only TypeScript, uh, in, de 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 developed in the TypeScript language. But if you start now doing those, I highly recommend to uh, use the tooling uh, provided by the CDK, where you can actually publish the components as for all these languages. Of course, it depends what your organizational needs are. But there's tools called JSII, PacMac JSII was the uh, uh, module that actually powers the CDK, so you can use it in different languages. Uh, so JSII, PacMac, and then uh, allow, that allow to, allows you to build for like different, there are some requirements that you have to organize your code in a certain way, but that allows you to publish it for different languages. And there's also this uh, Delivlib, uh, Delivlib, yeah, I said it right, uh, project in GitHub that uh, the CDK uh, people actually, I think they use themselves and provide this uh, basically a code pipeline setup where it tests your uh, constructs or components, what have you, that you want to publish to multiple uh, languages. It does tests for them in all the languages, and it also can publish to different repositories. So here in the example, there's GitHub and GitHub packages and Maven repo and, and, and NPM JS. Uh, but again, I haven't personally used this. This is, I think, something I'm going to try this year at some point. But uh, especially if you have people developing with different, different languages, this is a nice thing to have. Uh, Couple of mentions about challenges with CDK. It's based on cloud formation, so something if cloud formation can't do, then most probably CDK can't do, at least without uh, Lambda-backed custom resources. For example, if you have app, two stacks, different regions, you can't reference the values from the different regions. You have to have a, some kind of a Lambda custom resource there happening. Uh, it's fresh off the oven. The core uh, library is still, it's, it's already stable now, but there are other modules that are experimental, so be aware. Uh, even from the experimental modules, you could use the CFN uh, constructs, which are more stable. And keeping up with the CDK releases, it sometimes takes effort. For example, we have Slack bots always pinging us that, hey, there's a new version. And, and uh, if you test your info code, it's of course, that helps a lot. I, I've got almost all the bugs related to versioning there and lock your dependencies, of course. So I'm hoping uh, that after this, you're feeling more like this, that OK, CDK looks cool, I should check it out. So if you want to check it out, there are some resources. I'm not going to uh, say them out loud now because this will be recorded and I'm going to probably share at least this some, somewhere. But there are docs and workshops and, and, and listing about awesome resources out there. Um, 
I also want to show uh, quickly uh, in 24th of March, March 24th in Helsinki, there are several days uh, conference, uh, one day conference there, uh, tickets were quite cheap, I can't remember the price now, but anyway, um, and uh, I just actually last night uh, got an uh, email from them that my CFP was accepted, so I'm going to talk about CDK in serverless development, that if you do work with Lambda and other managed s services from AWS, how CDK works there, so if you're interested to hear more, so come to Helsinki in March. But, yeah, uh, Where's my presentation? Here. So, yeah, thank you. This has been a team effort working those, so follow, follow those. If there are any Finns in the audience, check out that almamedia.dev site, and there's my contact info. So, uh, And if you have questions, find me out later, because I have talked too much, and I want to go to lunch too, so, <laughs> but I'm here the whole evening, so find me then. Thank you. <laughs>